CLS Talks. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Real information. Talk to me. Education. Talk to me. Talk to me. This is the CLS Talks, a series of conversations discussing legality, lawfulness, and many other things besides. I'm Lionel Coveney, and, and he's I'm Des, Des Carty. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, Des? Lots of chunky things to talk about again. Oh, We're continuing our defences. Loads and loads of stuff. And thanks very much for having me on again. It's always a pleasure. Your pleasure is yours. <laughs> <laughs> In the middle of things, and we're discussing defence number four now, which is one that's close to my heart for the simple reason that I've used it in another case. Okay. Which on, we've discussed it in the past, but on the face of it, it seemed to be unsuccessful. The judge had a, a near stroke, as did the barrister when I used this in defence. But as it transpired, the order was never perfected. So for all outward appearances, it seemed like I lost that case to anyone who was in the courtroom. But in actuality, they didn't proceed and they didn't perfect the order. So it never became lawful or forceful. Um, again, just uh, w- I'd like folks to refer back to the other recordings that have been done in relation to the defences and the others prior to that as well. And we've raised this issue indirectly, but it, this is a different form now, once again, of jurisdiction, the issue of jurisdiction. But uh, you, you bang away there, with Lionel, and I'll jump in and interrupt you as I s- see the need. OK, well, okay. I was made where, aware of and I was very sceptical about this when I was first made aware of it, Mm -hmm. about a law dating back to 1688, okay? The Bill of Rights. Now, I'd never heard of the Bill of Rights. I thought it was something to do with the US and the Constitution over there. But there is a Bill of Rights that's actually... William of Orange, is it? (laughs) Well, yeah, we're going back to the time of William of Orange. Um, As the barrister tried to allude to and incorrectly stated... Anyway, I won't even get into the last case, but we've got a thing called the Bill of Rights, 1688. Now, 1688, how can that be? Well, this thing hasn't been repealed. And cannot be. And it cannot be. I mean, under the Statute Law Revision Act of 2007, go look it up, this has not been repealed, which means it stands. Or Our law, anyway, comes from UK law, so this is where this originated. And one of the reasons it hasn't been repealed is because it's the same law that we've heard of in the Dáil, Dáil Privilege, whereby anything can be said and nobody can be held liable for what they say in the Dáil. So... Mm -hmm. That's why this is still hanging around. Now, how does this affect us? Well, it affects us because, and I'm quoting, it states that all grants and promises of fines and forfeitures of particular persons before conviction are illegal and void. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you can't be fined or charged a fee or a forfeiture. So your car can't be towed away, for example, unless you've already been convicted in court. Now, when we receive a fine in the post, have we been convicted at that point? No. No, we haven't. No. So that's contrary to this 1688 Bill of Rights, in my opinion. So, therefore, right, we know that the guard hadn't served you correctly in, in relation to the notice mm. for the fine or the forfeiture, whatever you want to call it, because yep. you're forfeiting money then in terms of forfeitures. So if they had, say, uh, under their due process of law, served you correctly, given you the proper notice and all the rest of it, they were on the face of it had already convicted you mm, exactly w- on a foot of not having a court case yeah. or due process being carried out so that in itself would have been unlawful of course we've already discussed yeah. presumption of innocence exactly so again it, is, it boils down to this presumption of innocence that if you convict somebody without having a trial you presume they're guilty yeah so it's contrary them actually actually issuing notices of fines and expecting you to pay them is contrary to law. It's against the law. Yes. And it oh. doesn't matter how old that law is. Yeah. I mean, it hasn't been repealed. It hasn't been... It, it might... It was... Parts of it have been repealed and changed, but that specific part that we're talking about has not ever been repealed. Mm. And for me, this is incendiary because it essentially means that the way that the state collects monies is against the law. Against the so law. So anybody who has paid 
a toll road charge or anybody who has paid rhubarb pierce down there in Listole <laughs> from Pierce Fitzgibbon uh, another charge or fine for not paying that charge or anybody who's paid any kind of fine in this country ever ever has had all kinds of abuses done to them yes in law their property stolen uh, obviously fines t- and all the rest of it it's mm. all unlawful mm. but again like it takes somebody like yourself or myself perhaps even to go and put this before the court and the proof of the pudding is in the eating because as you suggested before now obviously this is not something you used at this juncture in this case yeah. uh, but it is an arguable potential defence in relation to if they had have issued the fine correctly in terms of their due process but the proof of the pudding was in the previous case that you were involved in whereby the judge would not and did not perfect the order because you raised this in terms of they weren't basically following due process mm. the, fa- the, the toll company or, and the solicitor representing them basically find you in absence of law yeah so that's why we'd suggest we'd imagine that the judge could not perfect the law because that would have opened him up to a judicial review and misconduct and I had made him aware that I was willing to go down that route so it's just another option for people if they want to at the outset challenge the validity of the fine or the charge itself from the outset whereby you have been sent a fine through the post Hmm. uh, you would open with this and then open it in court if it ended up in a court date you'd open with this to start with but not to make it your only defence mm. if you like because obviously you need more than as I say you need a, a several ways to skin the cat yeah okay so yeah that was my potential for it and the reason I used that one as the fourth one was I kind of figured I, I had seen firsthand the explosion that that caused in the courtroom the last time and I wanted to nip things as quickly as I could on that day in the bud and not have to go down the route potentially of judicial review and the whole lot because Mm. I think the fact that that is such an old law automatically most people assume oh well you can't do that and even the barrister in my experience had that attitude towards it for God's sake judge it's 1688 Mm -hmm. we can't be doing that you know that that was the actual attitude so the reason I went down the route that I did go down was because we had pieces of paper in front of us and it, it just seemed the most obvious thing to do but I wasn't going to leave it to chance and that's why I had four defences prepared yeah. and I had other kind of notes as well that potentially issues that I could have raised to potentially frustrate the court but, if but necessary again, even on the basis that you said we suggested before I mean I think four was the minimum that you would have gone forward with. But that four would have opened up into other potential defences as well. Once the cross-examination and the proper transcript was taken of the cross-examination, as, as we said before, the guard has to answer the questions. And once the re- questions are relevant and tight relating to the evidence and what he's alleging, then that means that you spend X amount of time with those four, first four defences. I yeah. don't imagine that they'd get all those defences done in one day. I don't think so, no. That means you have another opportunity to go back again and re-examine what the guard had stated relevant to the evidence he'd actually lodged with the the court. So then you can go back again and have another chop at it in terms of another potential defence and another potential defence because disclosure of evidence is ongoing as well. Yeah. So, I mean, if this is where the art of war, again, ties in neatly with what we're talking about. Well, not neatly, but there, there is a corollary between the two, is that you will only win a war if you're prepared to win the war. Yeah. If you don't give up, and that's it. Mm. If you do give up, you've lost. Or if they give up, they've lost. Somebody in the end is going to give up. Yeah. Either they're going to wear you down and get you and or force you to give evidence against yourself, or they are going to collapse one way or the other through all the different battles. Because they cannot... The gu- an average guard on the street cannot handle a decent cross-examination. Now, I've seen it time and time again in court. They don't know the law in most cases, and even when they do, they're not equipped to be able to handle the court situation. They're used to going and reading out of their notes and the judge saying, right, convicted or whatever, and it's just a process. And even the attitude of most of them in there, it's just, oh, they're picking up their overtime or whatever it is. They're doing what they have to do. They don't really engage in what's going on at all. And any time it gets a little bit hairy 
it becomes really hairy for them. You can see the pressure they're yeah. under and so many guards begin to sweat at the slightest thing that's off script, the yeah. slightest little thing. Even the fact that you would dare to cross-examine mm. is enough to wrong foot most of them. And the judges as well, we've seen that, that this in, in proof, I suppose. The judges tend to sta- sta- stand in when the guards are under pressure. Mm. They don't want them falling on their own swords, so to yeah. speak. And the judges then tend to either dismiss or strike out the case. Or, now it hasn't happened very often that I'm aware of, or the DPP, via the guards, would withdraw the case. Yeah. But, you know, that's another issue as well. But generally you find that the judges tend to stand in when the guard is under pressure. And we did see this in this case as well. Yeah. The judge who appeared on the face of it to be very nice and was tolerant of a lay litigant. Fair Actually, <laughs> yeah, a number of times she did state to the guard, well, can you not produce this document, that document, the other document, which of course he couldn't, but she gave him ample opportunity to do so, which she shouldn't have been doing. No, absolutely not. So I don't know what more to say. I think we've... Yeah, well, I survived it. I'm still here. There would be no CLS talks probably without me having survived these cases. <laughs> <laughs> We're grateful. We're wholly grateful. <laughs> Hope you listeners are grateful for this. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so again, of course, we welcome questions on it if there's anybody who wants to uh, get in w- touch. It was luck that got you through, wasn't well, it? Well, maybe it was. <laughs> and would you believe, having sat down with somebody and gone through this and shown the documentation and shown the court order, that was said to me by somebody still, ah, yeah, well, you still got lucky, didn't you? Oh, God. Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, what do you say about that? We have some very, very interesting episodes coming up. We'll be discussing the art of war, as we've mentioned, and some more surprises as well. One thing that I think is worth discussing not now, but again, and this is a surprise for I you, Des. It, it? Well, it's the issue of the seizure of vehicles and cars on the side yeah. of the road. Now, we touched on it in this with the Bill of Rights, yeah. um, but there's quite a lot of stuff. I've managed to collate some bits and pieces and some court judgments and orders that have been granted in this country relating to that specific issue. Mm-hmm. And there, we know so many people who have had cars taken on the side of the road by Gardaí, yeah. and we may just be able to point them in the right direction with regard to that. There's no guarantee yeah. that a guard won't break your window and drag you from the car but there is a recourse for follow-up action if necessary then as well, you know. but, but it's true in most cases that people do get out of the cars and submit to the cars and mm. hand them over the keys in most cases in most cases yeah, yeah they, they volunteer yeah, the they cars volunteer it. and the guards will say well, well they gave us the car like, you know, yeah. so what can we do we have to take it exactly so I think that's <laughs> yeah. something that we might be able to discuss and one or two people had mentioned it to me when I bumped into them that uh, they would like to hear that discussed ok so. well we can go through that as well yeah. and again folks like I know Lionel has said this and I've said this before don't be afraid to email us there isn't any such thing as a stupid question mm. Um, we do address all questions and I mean all questions we've ever gotten we've answered them all yeah. as best we could obviously yeah. so don't be afraid to email us it's info at the common uh, send in your questions and we'll do our best to address them fully brilliant and I'm looking forward to the next episode and get out there and read The Art of War because it's going to give you a really good grounding for what we'll be talking about over the next few episodes yeah. as I said before we will um, when we're refreshing the website we'll put it We'll try and see if we can get a copy, a PDF, and put it up there so those people can download it free. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I've enjoyed it as I always do. Thanks a million for joining me, Des. Thanks very much again, Lionel. We'll see you next time. Take care, folks. Bye. The CLS Talk.